So welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us today on our um, webinar series. We are very, very excited to have with us Emily and Sarah from Miami Consulting. And uh, I'll just get into introductions for that in just a moment. Uh, Ottawa Board of Trade continues its advocacy work on behalf of all of the businesses in the Ottawa area. Um, we are constantly working on issues to improve the environment in which Ottawa businesses operate. Of course, right now our focus continues to be on COVID-19 related issues. In particular, we are working on the rent relief issue. We continue to monitor what's happening with the wage subsidies and um, access to uh, PPEs as we slowly and responsibly re reopen up our, our economy. Um, sorry, just had a little bit of a, a, a brain blip there. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so unfortunately, Sue Ling was not able to be here with us today, but I know that she would want to make sure that everybody was uh, aware of some of the things that we're working on right at the moment. Um, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors and partners today because uh, we are a not-for-profit organization and we just simply cannot bring you these um, types of programs without their support and sponsorship. So I would like to thank our community partner, Ottawa Citizen, our event sponsor, Enbridge Gas, and today's presentation partner, Miami Consulting. Um, Miami Consulting <gasps> is a not-for-profit organization, a for-profit consulting business that uh, works with uh, organizations of all sizes and in all industries. And uh, I'm going to just move into our biographies of our presenters today. Sorry, this is not typically my role, so I'm a little out of it. So I want to introduce you to Sarah. Sarah possesses a CPA CA designation, as she's waving at you, uh, earned with a big four financial services firm. She's a certified information system auditor, and she has 12 years of experience in financial and non-financial risk management internal control monitoring, regulatory compliance, internal and external audit, IS and IT governance, and business continuity. She has worked with multiple clients throughout Canada and in the UK and in various industries, including financial services, public sector, not-for-profit, transportation, and banking. Sarah's focus stems from her training as a professional accountant and work as both an external consultant and industry leader. Sarah has a passion for improving financial risk and performance management activities. She uses creativity to develop the right size management systems, improving the effectiveness of policy instruments and processes, and the designing, implementing, and testing of internal controls. She's joined by her colleague, Emily Wilcox. Emily possesses an MBA from a top tier business school. She's a certified internal auditor designation and is a seasoned risk and performance management professional. Over the course of her 13 year career, she's focused on providing risk management, strategy and business transformation solutions to multiple clients in various industries in Canada, Australia, Ireland, Spain, and Peru. Emily specializes in providing her clients with tailored and operationally relevant risk advice, whether via the assessment of risks and implementation of mitigation strategies the facilitation of process and control assessments, the conduct of change management activities, and the development of strategic directions and solutions or the provision of performance improvement services. Now, all that sounds like quite a mouthful, but what I can absolutely guarantee you is that Sarah and Emily are gonna walk us through a conversation on the basics of business continuity planning this is a really important activity for all businesses at all times, but never more so important than right now. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and I will now turn it over to Sarah. You all set, Sarah? I am. Let me know if you guys can all see this presentation. Is that coming across okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. So we are seeing your uh, note, your next slide as well. 
Oh, okay. How do I undo that? Okay, I got it. Okay, good. But I don't know how to change that view. I think if you just show it. There we go. Like that, you can minimize the next the slides on the left. I okay. Over yet. How do I bring this down? I want to bring this all the way down. Okay, I'll do it like this. Is that okay for everybody? It looks wonderful. Okay, awesome. Here we go. Okay. So thank you all for coming and Emily and I have worked to create a presentation that's going to be as meaningful as it can be to everybody at this point in time. Um, we're covering basics of business continuity, but we're definitely also going to be articulating concepts that would be relevant right now for the pandemic scenario, um, which is happening and to discuss some insights that we made from talking to different business owners on how these concepts can help you operationalized right now given the changing environment and even just the recent developments of the last few days. So the objectives today, um, we're going to talk, this is the rough agenda for today and it'll be a back and forth between Emily and I, um, but we'll talk about the objectives. So we want to understand the work that needs to be done in order to inform a good business continuity plan, uh, provide some basic guidance to everyone to support any size business in enhancing their business continuity practices in managing interim operating models, which essentially is what business continuity is. And then recognize common pitfalls and how to avoid them. So just trying to keep everybody efficient and effective and lean in terms of what they can do to help operationalize things in a different way um, for the time being. So we wanted to just acknowledge the pandemic, discuss the impact that that's had on everybody because it has created a totally different environment to work and has created the need for business continuity measures in a widespread manner. So we've had the closures of non-essential services. Um, lots of them have been allowed to open up recently. Um, there's still always that overhanging possibility that things will close down again, depending on what happens with the virus and the spread and containment. Um, we've seen a lot of rapid transitions that have needed to occur where people need to move to a virtual work environment very quickly uh, to suddenly have online offering, offering capabilities to their customers and then have to create a contactless product and service delivery. Um, people are dealing with all different kinds of challenges like limited resources, people aren't as available, their supply chain has been disrupted, there's issues with obtaining financing, um, even though there's lots of different support coming out, it's not always easy for everybody to access it. And even workspace is totally different now. We have to distance with larger amounts between people. And so the workspace isn't really necessarily as usable as it was before. And then we have unpredictable timelines. Um, some people are, are ready to reopen. Some people aren't ready at all, even though they could reopen. And some people are waiting because they operate within a mall or a different um, place of business. So we just we wanted to make sure we considered all of this stuff when we presented the material today. Um, but there is some good news. So I did want to point that out because especially in Ottawa and in Ontario, we're uniquely positioned for a good recovery. The Conference Board of Canada um, issued a provincial outlook for spring 2020. And certainly it is acknowledging the fact that the economy is expected to shrink. I'm sure everybody knows this, um, but we're expected to shrink by 3.2%, but should resume growth in, in the second half of the year and into 2021. Um, the hardest hit Sectors have been food services, accommodations, air transportation, retail, and culture and manufacturing. Manufacturing's been able to adapt a little bit in filling some gaps that have been identified. But there is good news in that we're expected to grow at a faster pace than other provinces in terms of Ontario. We have a GDP growth rate that's forecasted for 6% in 2021. Um, and we're expected to see a stronger consumer spending um, like more resilient consumer spending than other provinces and in Ottawa compared to other cities due to the dense urban populations and the higher rate of employment from professional and business services. And even in, in looking at the insights specific to Ottawa that the conference board offered, we're definitely seeing a drop in GDP and a drop in employment, but then a recovery of those things and including a drop in retail sales, but a recovery of that that would make up for that in late 2020 and in 2021. So it's a huge opportunity right now for those companies that can adapt their 
business models to grab more market share and to and to basically benefit from a gap in the market and a recovery that's about to come. So we hope that this can be helpful in positioning people to do so. And that's what we had in the back of our minds in, in the entire uh, development of this presentation. So I'm going to pass it over to Emily to provide kind of the outline of how we're going to present this information. Okay, thanks, Sarah. So that was a good um, overview or, or of our objectives and why we're here today. Um, we're tr not going to try not to make this too dense, but there is a lot of information in this deck, so we will be providing it afterwards um, so that you can kind of go back over what we, some of the, the concepts we're going to go through. Um, and I, I wrote in the chat after Lynn as well that um, we'll be monitoring questions uh, or the chat for questions. So if you have any questions about something very specific to what we're talking about right now, um, please write it in the chat uh, so that we can, we can answer it right away. If, if not, we can also ask it in the Q&A. Um, so yeah, business continuity basics. I guess one of the things I wanted to say is, you know, we're already in the middle of, of a sort of business continuity scenario. And so why are we talking about this right now? Well, it's something that you want to keep thinking about um, over the course of what's going, excuse me, what's going on right now, as well as for other scenarios, because it can help you sort of plan for other things that could happen while we're, while we're moving through this pandemic and the different act phases of actions that are going to be um, occurring. But it also can help you in the future to prepare for other things, because we now know that things that we don't expect to happen do happen, and we probably want to be a bit more prepared for them. Um, so we're going to go through the basics and we're going to try to tie it back to the pandemic uh, in, in, in many ways, but we'll also talk about other sort of scenarios that could happen. Um, so this slide is really around the five things that you would need to think about. That's prepare, decide, communicate, execute, and monitor, as you can read. I'm going to start with prepare, um, as Sarah has highlighted here. And I'm going to start with the first part of prepare, and then Sarah's going to go into the next piece. Preparing is perhaps the most important part. Um, if not the most important, it's one you're going to keep coming back to, um, because you are going to keep rethinking of what are all the things that could happen and what are my core objectives. So yeah, Sarah, sorry, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. So the first piece of doing a pre or preparing for a business continuity um, plan is to do a business impact assessment or a BIA. I don't know how many of you have heard of this before, but really this is looking at how your business operates, um, what you would want to be operational during um, a continuity scenario or during an emergency, and then pri prioritizing what you would need to put in place in order to do that. So I'll walk through each one. Um, Define, so the four, the four steps to a BIA are defining your core objectives, review, reviewing your internal landscape, differentiating, uh, and then prioritizing. So what is defining your core objectives? Well, as with any kind of planning exercise, you really want to base what you're doing with a BCP on your core values and core objectives. So your core values are going to drive your objectives overall in your business. And then in terms of a continuity scenario, you want to identify what the core objectives are for your business in that sort of interim operational model, as Sarah pointed out earlier. So some of the examples we've come up with are things like minimize financial loss, continue to serve your customers, protect your reputation, uh, maintain your market position, uh, make sure you have, um, Maybe you just make sure that the, the, uh, the business is still there at the end of the continuity scenario so that you can sort of restart. So it could be, there's a number of different objectives that you could um, identify. You probably can't do all of them or not even probably, uh, you, you can't do all of them. So you really have to identify the ones that, that are really aligned with your business values in order to understand um, what's best for your business during an emergency scenario. Um, once you've identified those core object objectives, you then want to look at your internal landscape. And your internal landscape is looking at all this, the systems and processes you have in place, um, all your key partners, your suppliers, your clients. Really, um, for small organizations, it's kind of like doing a business model canvas. I don't know if you're familiar with that, that, but it is something that you can do to help sort of identify what your business model looks like. And it has a lot of those key areas that you have to put on paper. So you know who your suppliers are, what your processes are, what your IT system looks like. Um, for larger businesses, you probably want, it might be a little too simplistic to use a business model canvas, but you really wanna do an inventory of all of those things. 
Um, and, and once you've done that, it's really to make sure you have a documentation of, of how your business works because you're going to need to use that um, going forward as you develop the playbook for, um, for your business continuity plan. The next thing you want to do is identify what are the what aspects of your business or what service lines are critical, what are essential, and what are considered to be supporting or things that you do that are maybe aren't core to your business or core to your core objectives. Um, so in this, I've, I've kind of used, uh, I've developed a scenario where we, we think of a bank. So a bank might have a core objective of minimizing financial loss and continuing to serve customers in the scenario we're in right now um, in the pandemic. So what aspects are critical? Well, probably if they're minimizing financial loss, they need as access to the markets and they need their IT systems to be working so they can understand how much money they have and what, you know, where the potential for loss is. Probably also some sort of, um, if you're continuing to serve customers, you need access to the customers or customers need access to a bank. Um, some, some of the customer access could be essential or supporting rather than critical. So for example, um, you think of like immediate transactions, the ability to move money around is probably essential. Where, whereas um, opening a new loan or a new bank account might not be something that you need um, immediately, but could be something that could wait a couple of weeks. So that's really what we mean by differentiate. It's like looking at your core objectives, looking at the processes you have in place, what's critical to make sure you meet your core objectives, and then what are the systems and the things that you have in place that support those critical and essential, um, those critical and essential uh, services. So for example, if you need to minimize financial loss, you need your IT systems to be working correctly um, and to have your security in place, et cetera. You would also, again, need um, either a team that's, that's working behind the scenes to make sure that happens um, versus you might not have your on-site uh, locations open until such time that you can be sure that everybody is safe um, uh, when they're accessing the online, sorry, in-person locations. So that's sort of the BIA. Um, it's, there's a lot here and I'm not gonna go into any more detail, but you can definitely ask us questions about this. Once you have identified your sort of core objectives and your critical, essential and supporting processes though, then you're gonna do my favorite part. Um, and this might sound funny, but um, essentially the next step is scenario analysis. And I'm gonna do a little plug here. Um, we actually have a survey that we would love for people who are on this call to, to answer once um, we're finished. Um, and if you answer the survey, you get a little article we wrote about scenario analysis. Scenario analysis is a powerful tool to help with planning and, and uh, help identify opportunities and things, but it's also very much used in, in business uh, continuity planning. And the reason is, is that once you've identified the, uh, your core objectives and the, the sort of critical services, you wanna understand what different scenarios could happen that could cause you to, to go into a continuity scenario. So of course, we've got pandemic highlighted here. Pandemic was something that um, I'm sure a lot of people didn't plan for. Um, I know even in our business, we weren't, we weren't planning for a pandemic, um, but it's definitely something is now on our radar. Um, other things like natural disaster is more, uh, more common, I think. Um, people think about earthquakes or tornadoes. Um, we certainly have had a few of those, um, or floods, those, those have happened in Ottawa um, recently. Um, but then there's other things like IT failure or data loss, cyber attacks, privacy breaches, etc. So it's basically scenario analysis is, take, is thinking of all the things that could happen that could cause some sort of continuity loss and then identifying in, in thinking of those scenarios, so brainstorming the scenarios and then thinking, how does that actually affect our business? So in a cyber attack scenario, if I'm a restaurant and I don't really have an online presence, it's probably not gonna affect me that much um, unless it's a cyber attack to my bank and I, all my banking information is leaked. So, so I think that's really where the scenario analysis and the BIA go together, because you say, okay, now I've developed my BIA, I know what's critical for my business. In this scenario, is anything affected? And how can I achieve my core objectives if this scenario um, happens? Um, when you're doing a scenario analysis, you do want to um, make some assumptions. So, um, and I think this is really interesting because as we've noted um, also in the pandemic, um, whereas 
what's happened to most businesses or a number of businesses is that it's sort of stopped the ability to work for a period of time or it's had people have to have to adapt. So restaurants have um, where they didn't, pre didn't previously do takeout, they're now doing takeout or, or some have even sort of pivoted to, to be sort of pseudo grocery stores and things like that. But on the other side, you've got companies like Amazon or Lysol or Purell, where demand has gone up significantly and they've actually had to pivot in a different way. Um, where Amazon has had to sort of uh, stop, stop delivering all but essential um, goods and items at the beginning and then has had to ramp up in terms of their logistics and delivery in order to be able to meet demand. So there's a number of different things that could happen either way. So you have to sort of think about both sides. Um, and I think that's, I think Sarah, you're going to jump in from here, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and then just to just layer on top of Emily, so in the scenarios, if you also add the assumptions to the of like, what if it caused demand to increase drastically and decrease, like she said in the examples, and what if it occurred at the peak cycle? So you're really looking at a scenario under a worst case kind of example yeah. as what you're doing to think about so that you then feel armed and equipped to truly handle whatever comes your way because you have some sort of plan in place to deal with it all or as best that you can. So this process of doing the BIA, identifying scenarios, and then layering some assumptions on top of that will already help you identify needs and gaps before they're, they're actually a reality for you. So you might realize, okay, I might need a larger stockpile of supplies because that helps me out in a bunch of different scenarios. Or enhanced internal controls and monitoring for IT security. New business processes, access to system functionality, uh, updates to internal policies and, and training. So it might identify already some stuff that you can proactively do. And then it'll highlight gaps, like you might have critical information maintained in someone's head that you might not be able to access, undocumented critical procedures, key personnel who don't have a backup, um, barriers to emerging health and safety requirements, over-reliance on suppliers, all the different things that are here. And I'm sure many people have identified this with what's happened now. So. A lot of what we can do is take all the lessons that we've learned at this point in time and just make them easier to access as this thing ebbs and flows. So as Emily mentioned, we are conducting a survey. It's a three question survey that will go out as a link to the recording of this session to all of you. And it's literally just a way for us to better understand how businesses have impacted so we can figure out a better way to help and support. Um, and then, yeah, in, in exchange for this survey participation, we'll give you a detailed article on how to perform scenario analysis. But uh, we would just, we just want to understand in more detail as of today, what is really impacting people out of that list of needs and gaps that have been identified. Okay, back to Em. Cool. Um, I'm actually going to, I know we're, we're, we've got a timeline, but does anyone, is there anyone that wants to say anything about how they're being impacted or is it, or maybe that's for more for the Q&A. Okay, I'll wait till the Q&A to, to have a more detailed conversation. Um, and I, I'll just note that, um, that Lynn did post the link to the survey in, uh, in the chat as well. So if you want to go and do the survey right now, that's like uh, Sarah said, it's only three questions, so it shouldn't take too much time, but it just um, will help us to sort of understand a little bit better how people are being impacted and if there's any sort of themes. Um, so prepare was a big topic and I, I spoke a lot. Um, the next the next couple of topics I'm gonna talk about are decide and communicate. Those are the next two steps. They're a little bit lighter, um, but they're very important. Uh, so, and, and then Sarah's gonna talk more about the execution side. So um, decide is really around, once you've identified your, um, your core objectives and you know what is critical and essential and um, supporting, and you've also looked at the different scenarios that are relevant to your business, because um, of course, like we said, if you're a restaurant, you're probably not looking at cyber attacks. Um, everyone has to, like this is true for every business, you, you need to decide on how you're gonna operate in an emergency scenario or in a business continuity scenario. So there's four things you need to do. The first is to identify your business continuity management team. Um, during an emergency, as you probably are aware because we just lived through it, um, not everybody can be in charge. Um, and maybe even the, senior, the typical senior management of your organization aren't the right people to be in charge. Maybe you need more subject matter expertise on the business continuity management team, like IT, security, communications, uh, operations, et cetera. 
So you need to identify who is that team that's going to be running things while you're in the emergency scenario. The second thing, is, and it's very related, is establishing a clear chain of command. So even if you're a flat organization um, that you know does things by consensus in an emergency, you need to get things done ASAP. So you need to know who's making decisions, how they're getting the, those decisions up the chain, and um, sort of how that works. So you need to, uh, either a process map or just a clear documentation of, of what that means. Similarly, you need to identify roles, responsibilities, and accountabilities for all the team. So um, people, who, employees of your organization, even if their only role is to sit at home and wait for more instructions, need to know that that's what their role is. So you need to really clarify who's doing what and what the accountabilities are during um, an emergency scenario. And this could change over the course of the scenario, but at least documenting the first few um, will help you when you're just responding to the immediate scenario that's happening. And then the, the fourth thing, sorry, is documenting the procedures for decision making and escalation. In addition, documenting how the things are going to work. Um, so exactly what, what should be done as you roll out your, um, your playbook for the, um, for the scenario that's, that's, that's in, in front of you is really key here. So documentation will help you to make sure that you can do things efficiently and that you already know what's happening and you're not starting from scratch. Um, and then similarly, for communicate, it's equally as important to decide. Um, so you've decided who's in charge, you've decided what the chain of command looks like, and now you need communications. And I have a background in communication, so I think they're the most important thing for most businesses, or all businesses anyway, and all relationships really. Um, but they, it becomes even more important in um, emergency scenarios. So um, ensuring that you have a chain of communications in place and you know how that's going to work is, is key. Um, then preparing a disaster directory. So understanding all your employee contact information, making sure you have that written somewhere, pr preferably in your playbook. Um, what are your key customers? Who are your key suppliers? Who are your backup suppliers, your emergency services? Just putting together that directory so you know who you would email and who um, you would contact in, in case of an emergency or when faced with a scenario um, that impacts business continuity. And then finally, um, there's preparing your templates. So again, you don't want to be writing and approving uh, communications in the middle of managing the actual emergency. So having your internal communications, having your key client communications, having your key um, supplier communications, and then your um, public facing communications already templated in some format will help to ensure that you're not starting from scratch again and that you're, you're sort of on the path already to um, getting people the information they need at the time when everything's a little bit in confusion. So yeah. Okay, awesome, thanks Em. So when we get into execution, so everything we've said thus far has been, you know, getting ready to act. And now we're going to talk about execution and we're going to use the scenario of the pandemic to talk through this. And um, at this point in time, it's probably like too little information too late for a lot of people on the pandemic, but hopefully pieces of this can still be helpful for you right now. And we're going to zero in specifically on this section as well, because I think that's where we are right now at this point in time. And we'll talk about the customer experience and what we perceive to be the barriers that are holding people back from buying goods and procuring services and just being more economically active right now. So step one, you engage your team, you execute your procedures. So you decide and you start to communicate, you release the stuff that was templated and updated now internally to suppliers, customers on your website or social media, you operationalize your key personnel. And then here we have, you start to communicate your new processes. So how we're going to be doing business online and in store now, under the pandemic model, how we're going to make sure we keep people safe. So employee policies and protocols would need to be created or guidelines um, quickly. So how they're supposed to be managing safety equipment and managing physical distancing, what the new sick leave policy is and, and procedures for people who are symptomatic. And then make sure you have mechanisms in place to monitor and enforce compliance because this piece is so critical to maintaining your confidence in coming into work every day, your employees' confidence, and your customers in their experience in working with you. And as you start to operate, you're going to then identify new risks and issues that are, that are holding you back, and you just need to address each of those like you would in your normal course of business, which one's the most likely and the highest impact, 
Is it which one's going to have the most impact to your cost or your ability to manage uh, to continue to provide services to customers? And with the most highest impact, highest likelihood issues and risks, those are the ones that you're going to address systematically in your business to try to just keep giving yourself an opportunity to operate and operate. And so that's a whole other suite of risk risk management work that is uh, integral to doing a business, but this is sort of how it would play out. So focusing in really on this, what I have in a square, which is like where we are right now, the problem that people are feeling is customers are held back right now by health and safety concerns. So they have a great relationship with this restaurant or this retailer that they've always enjoyed working with. And, but right now they just don't have the confidence that that company is managing health and safety properly. So the goal for businesses who want to continue during this pandemic is going to be to earn customer confidence within the new normal. And the solution to that problem is to provide clear and transparent disclosures of what protocols you're using, how customers can access your goods and services, and then keep demonstrating to them in every interaction that you are adhering to what you say you're doing. That will be the difference between earning back a customer, earning a new customer, or losing a customer. And I know it's very confusing right now even how you're supposed to operate. Like we put together this list of resources and I've read these all in detail myself and there's so many different guidelines in place right now. The Ottawa Public Health has issued a cleaning and disinfectant checklist. There's guidance for high risk essential workplaces and different guidance for food services and retail stores. They're trying to be helpful. They provide posters for physical distancing and spread of germs, signages, like stop before entering and self-screen. Should I be entering the facility if anyone in my house has symptoms and that sort of thing. And Ontario Public Health recently released sector-specific guidance for all the sectors I've listed here and posters for employees. There's a standard operating procedure guideline by the Retail Council of Canada issued. But at the end of the day, these are a set of guidelines and detailed documents, but what does this actually mean for how I actually need to manage flow of traffic and protocols in my store? And is, is it worth my time and effort right now to do that? Or should I be focusing more on my online business, which is booming and getting that streamlined and making sure I'm fulfilling online orders appropriately? So there's a lot of decisions that need to be made right now. But at the end of the day, bringing it all back to the goal what you do next and what businesses do within this period of time right now will earn customer confidence or it won't. So advice around this scenario would be, make sure your online messaging is super clear, whether it's through your social media or on your website, that you're strictly following the Ontario Public Health or Ottawa Public Health guidance for disinfecting and cleaning and making sure that when people come on site to see your store, that the signage, the process, and the general customer experience is reinforcing to them that you're doing what you said you're gonna do. That sort of thing spreads very quickly through word of mouth that they felt really comfortable or very uncomfortable when they went to your establishment. And make sure that your employee conduct, their observable actions and behaviors are all demonstrating adherence. This stuff is just really important for people who are worried. And so the customer experience and how everybody sort of brands themselves as they reopen right now is, just going to be so essential to gaining back that market share and proving that you're adapting. And then to finish it all off, we kind of already walked through this, but that's kind of the execution process. So once you have all the plans in place to know what to do, the execution process is just a lot easier to execute. And right now we are where we are. We can still take the lessons learned that we've, we've gotten out of experiencing the pandemic. And then from this point, point on, just conduct ourselves efficiently and do the best we can with like the new guidance and the new kind of realm that's developing around us of how everyone's supposed to be operating. Okay, so it's back to M. Can we just go back to the last slide for one second? Yeah, so the other thing that I wanted to add here is that, and I just wanted to address number eight a little bit, um, because actually as we reopen the, as we reopen, like Sarah's talked a lot about what you will need to do to make sure you're, you're communicating how your, your adherence to uh, guidelines and, and, um, and how you gain back customer um, support and, and confidence. But in addition to that, there's other things that you can be doing, as Sarah said, with the lessons learned. Um, you also can be thinking about as we um, sort of unlock ac ac economic activity and as the stages or the phases of the um, resumption of, of business uh, are go through are gone through man i can't speak <laughs> as we go through those in my journey, 
<laughs> yeah. As we resume services, there's different parts of the, there's different stages mean different things for your business. So although you might have done a BCP or you were forced to do a BCP at the beginning of the pandemic because your, your whole business model was sort of turned upside down, there are still things that might happen over the course of the next few months that you might want to identify how that will affect your business. So constantly looking at the new risks and opportunities that each stage will afford your business is really important at this point. So I thought of a few things. Um, for example, although you might be, if you are a store, because we're, we've used that example in a couple, um, a couple of times and you have reopened, but then you're in a, an, an area of the community that has a, a surge of cases and there's a localized lockdown, what will that mean for your store going forward? So as Sarah said, are you focusing all your efforts on getting your on-site um, underway or do, are you kind of splitting your time between online and on-site? Just things to think about like that. Um, in addition, um, again, using the store example, uh, cities are shutting down um, some of the traditional um, like streets that were open to, to cars and things and they're shutting them down for bicycles and more pedestrians. So what does that mean for shop fronts? Is it there the opportunity to actually gather, get new customers because more people are walking by your store? Um, and how can you maintain that or that market share if you do manage to attract it, et cetera. So there's both new risks and new opportunities that are gonna arise um, as we go through the next stages. And it's important to sort of think about those things um, as well as the lessons learned for what you've done so far in order to better prepare yourselves for the next few months as this rolls out um, and then I think for the next slide um, essentially this is just a sort of pretty picture of what it looks like if you do have a BCP in place so if you have a BCP a BCP that identifies a few different scenarios then hopefully what you're able to do is as soon as the event occurs um, say the pandemic is um, is announced uh, and and people start to go into um, lockdown mode or, or the country starts to go into lockdown mode, you're able to activate your BCM team and they all know their roles and responsibilities. Um, you've already planned for some sort of scenario that is at least close enough to this that you know how your business is gonna deal with it. And so you can look up in your playbook, the scenario that, that has to do with some sort of um, epidemic or healthcare crisis. And then you identify what needs to be changed, how the communications need to be um, adapted for the particular scenario, um, who's in charge and, and how, who you need to um, contact, et cetera. And hopefully you're able to do that fairly smoothly so that your business continues. And of course, a, over the whole course of this, um, this pathway, you're continually assessing how this particular scenario actually affects you and how your business is able to continue under the current scenario. Okay. So we're gonna round this out with um, monitor, which is sort of like the, the final part of business continuity. And it's more for mature, mature organizations that have been doing business continuity for long enough to be able to monitor it. But there are some aspects that can be brought in right away. So you can, you can put your lessons learned from going through an experience into improving your plan. So how accurate were the scenarios? How sufficient were your responses? Did you have previously unidentified opportunities to adapt where you were like, well, this scenario seemed horrible, but then there was actually this and this opportunity within it that we didn't see and it ended up being very lucrative for our business. Like the ones who are now jumping into online delivery or online ordering and delivery or different kinds of service offerings. And then how did the adherence and compliance go in terms of key business continuity activities? Were, were you able to actually use the templates you developed? Were, your, were people, your key personality able to operate just how did it go can always be uh, aspects that you reflect on but then in a more sort of uh, advanced state business continuity monitoring programs would actually have a suite of indicators that would help you monitor ongoing readiness so you could always sort of take a look at and have a reporting mechanism around the percent of critical business processes without backup capabilities so that could be system-wise or process-wise and can, what sort of recovery time objective could you meet if one of them went down um, so how much, lo how long could you be like out of operations missing that one process and what would be your target recovery time? Percent turnover of critical personnel is always a good thing to monitor. Um, percent of, crit of critical materials without a stockpile, equipment without a backup, suppliers without a backup or contractual terms that don't actually consider a recovery time objective when something goes wrong. 
And then you want to just keep testing it. So making sure that if something happens, everybody knows where to go to get the templates in the disaster directory and who's making the decisions and how that decision is escalated up the chain. Like just testing these things out so that when it does happen, it's not as clunky and you just keep everybody kind of current in their role and responsibility within this. So these are the ongoing monitoring mechanisms that people could be using to just keep a good eye on the readiness of their company. Yeah, uh, perfect. And then here are some common pitfalls, and I'm sure uh, I'm sure this has happened um, to some of us, to some of you, and to some of us during this this uh, pandemic, uh, the time that we've been dealing with this. Um, one of the main ones uh, would be focusing on the wrong scenarios. So this is a, sort of outside of the pandemic, but if you are developing a number of scenarios um, for your BCP, so that you um, so that you're prepared for a number of different uh, worst case scenarios, um, making sure you focus on the right ones or the ones ones that are most relevant to your business is really important. So again, I'll go back to the restaurant versus and a cyber attack or, or a privacy breach. Um, if your if your restaurant doesn't have an online presence and uh, is mostly foot traffic, it's probably not a cyber attack that you need to be focused on. Um, similarly, making everything critical. So again, if you go back to the business impact assessment, um, the uh, we talked about critical, essential, and support uh, processes or service lines. If you put everything in critical, then that's essentially running your business as usual, and that's not possible during an emergency situation. So making sure you understand or really differentiate what's critical to making your business run and also what's critical to those core objectives. So again, you're not going to choose every objective during an emergency situation. So what are the critical service lines that help that enable you to achieve your core objectives um, and, and thereby focusing on those things that you can really have control over is, is important during um, a BCP. Um, another common fit pitfall is no employee communication or buy-in. So as Sarah just said, if you're monitoring and, and you're getting people to sort of to understand where things are, or what their roles are um, on a regular basis when you're not in an emergency situation, that when you are in a, an emergency situation, um, you'll have people understanding what they need to do um, and, and be aware that that's what's expected of them. Um, I think this is very critical. As I noted before, I think communication is probably the most important. Um, the other, the fourth one is, is similar. So failing to keep the plan current. Uh, if you did a BCP 10 years ago, it's unlikely that the steps in it are the same ones you would take today. The, just the, the technology landscape has changed. Maybe you've grown as an organization, etc. cetera. Um, there's probably others, some other pitfalls we haven't thought about. Um, I'm sure that you guys can, could actually provide us with some. I know in our own business, we've just like everyone else have had to sort of adapt and not pivot entirely, but think of, of new things that we need to do during this, this time. Um, and, and although we uh, have strategies in place, they've changed from what we expected them to be um, at the beginning because, because the scenario and the situation continues to change, which is why we're on, that's ongoing monitoring is so important. Okay, thanks Sam. So we just wanted to end on a positive note with an inspirational quote. And it's more just about the fact that this can be an opportunity for businesses to adapt and evolve. And, if you become leaner and you become more accessible, it could be in the long run like a great thing that this learning opportunity came by. So if you're always trying to be normal, you will never know how amazing you can be. It's a quote from Maya Angelou and we just wanted to kind of close it off on a positive note. We hope everyone's doing all right. And uh, if anyone has any questions, it'd be our pleasure to, to answer as best we can. Well, that was amazing, Emily and Sarah. Thank you so much. We're just going to pause for a moment so that Emily and Sarah can catch their breath and people can post their questions in the chat. We do have a couple waiting for us. Um, while we are waiting, I just want to take a moment or two and once again thank our sponsors, the Ottawa Citizen, who is our community partner, um, Enbridge Gas, who is an event sponsor, and of course, Miami Consulting, who has been our presentation sponsor this morning. And just a quick infomercial about some of the other webinars that we have coming up. On Friday, May 22nd, we are launching a brand new affinity program with an organization called Barter Pay. And there is a free webinar this Friday 
to learn more about it. But it's a really awesome new thing that people can use to get the services and goods that they need for their businesses without depleting their cash. So think about that in the context of where we sit right now. This is a really great program, so I encourage you to check it out. In our Wellness Wednesday series tomorrow, we are very, very fortunate to have Dr. Vera Etches from Ottawa Public Health joining us. She is going to talk about the importance of getting outside and getting that fresh air and sunshine and how it impacts our physical and mental well-being. And she will also talk about mask use. When are we supposed to use non-medical masks? How are we supposed to wear them? And how do we care for them? So as we all get ready to reopen in a responsible way and to get outside and get some fresh air, this is very, very timely. Next Wednesday, next week on May the 27th, our friends at Freeform Fitness are going to walk us through why we are having a hard time getting motivated to make positive changes in our lifestyle because this is the perfect opportunity to do it and how to get that motivation going so that we can work on our mental and physical well-being. And in our regular series of webinars on Thursday of this week, we're going to join Business Sherpa Group as they talk about the importance of digitizing your finance function. I know that Emily and Sarah would be uh, big supporters of that, <laughs> that particular uh, theory. Next week, we're going to join Rhapsody Strategy as they talk about rethinking your business. Um, I've heard a number of people talk about the pandemic as being a gift of time because there's an awful lot of business owners that are planning and thinking about their business in ways that they never would have during normal day-to-day -day business activity. We are also going to hear from May, on May 28th from Scott Moran. He is going to talk about how to keep your leadership team meetings effective in the face of disruption. There is never more important time to make sure that your leadership team or your management team is all working at their best and uh, definitely while we're uh, physically distanced from each other. It's a great idea when we actually do come together that we're effective when we do so. We are going to have MNP join us on June the 4th. John Haralovich is going to talk about managing debt in a time of uncertainty. So there's all kinds of financial vehicles available out there for people who are struggling. He's going to walk everyone through what their options are. And finally, um, on June 11th, Lewis Eisen, who is an author and well-known speaker, is going to talk to us about making new rules work. So a number of us are going to be posting rules. You must wear a mask for service. You must do this, you must do this. Lewis is a specialist in helping businesses and organizations write rules that invites people to comply with them. So that is going to be a very, very interesting session. So I am going to turn it back over to Emily and Sarah to answer questions. The first thing I want to say is there was a question about your slide deck and will we share it. Your slide deck is amazing and it's almost like a tiny little reference book on business continuity planning. So we are delighted to share that. We will send the slide deck out when we send out the recording link to the webinar today. So everyone who is registered will get a copy of those slides. So thank you for asking that. And I want to move to our first question. And our first question is from Murray. And it sounds like Murray has already been doing business continuity planning. He has asked, uh, redundant systems and stockpiles cost money. How do you suggest we best evaluate the cost of business continuity preparations with the scenario risks they mitigate? And Murray, if you want to unmute yourself and actually uh, have the conversation with Emily and Sarah, I invite you to do that. There he is. There I is. I'll wait for the answer and then I'll uh, call him up. I go, hi, Sarah. Great. I think I'm going to turn it over to Sarah because she's the accountant. So I think that she's probably a little bit better placed to, to talk about that. But I'll, I'll chime in after she started. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that it's definitely like a cost benefit question and it would be in relation to how likely and significant do you think the impacts would be that that cost would be mitigating so if you're looking at a redundant system that would essentially protect you from like four out of five scenarios and allow your team to operate 
and the cost of that, when you look at that in the big picture, is manageable to you. It's an investment that's worth taking if if you don't do it in four to five scenarios, you can't operate and you're losing, you know, like 10% of your revenue or more every year without it. So it's 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 got to be like a systematic analysis of what would be the impact and how likely do I think this impact could be? What would be the cost of that impact financially to my organization and then the investment of a redundant system or a stockpile? Just having that full picture to make that decision. I mean, it's not an easy answer. And I know that oftentimes people don't have the ability to, to get all these things as a backup, but some of them might be worth your time and your money. So it would all come down to the business impact assessment and the scenarios that you think would most hit you and looking at how they would hurt you. Thanks, that makes sense. Okay. Did you have any follow on question from that or is that, no, nope, that's perfect, okay. Okay, we're ready for our next question. And this was posted by Laurent. The major challenge in the current context is maintaining business continuity through a long period of disruption. Have all had all companies ever foreseen such a long period and each company probably needs to take it into account in future scenarios. So Laurent, did you want to ask a specific question or would you just like to uh, get into a conversation with Sarah and Emily? I think, I think actually this was a point that I, when I was sort of preparing for this, um, I'll just start and then Laurent, if you want to say anything else. I also, it, it was in my head that this is probably the longest business continuity um, scenario that we would ever, um, like most people wouldn't have planned for something that's this long. Um, okay. Even the current two and a half months that we're, we're in right now is longer than most people plan for. Um, and for sure, the fact that we're thinking about the next maybe year, year and a half of being in some, in some sort of business con continuity, we don't really know what it's going to look like until we get a vaccine, right? So that's not normal. But I think what we, what you can do in your business continuity plans is identify what the impacts. So, so what Sarah was saying is if you identify what the impacts are um, under each scenario, um, the other thing you can look at is that what those impacts look like for certain timelines. So you can plan for uh, what's an, a week long continuity effort versus a, a month long versus a two month long versus a six month long. And what, what does that look like? Yeah, because usually you, you, you told uh, a very interesting part of the business continuity job is scenario analysis. And that's from my experience, this is something what I, I'm used to it in, in the and with the, um, the risk assessment as well, you know, operational risk assessment. Well, uh, we are very much focused on which are the different resources and we think about, okay, we will start again in a few weeks or something like this. Yeah, usually. And this is, this is something which is, uh, which is quite new for all of us. It's yeah. to think, okay, we will have to, uh, to think longer, you know, in, uh, in longer terms, um, maybe, and, uh, and probably this is uh, one, one additional dimension for all of us to take into consideration in the scenarios. This is, this is more, let's say, a, re a note well, that we have, well, everybody has no noticed, but, um, but this is something we knew that we have to, to take just uh, into consideration. And I think, so besides, so I agree with you, so adding a timeline to your considerations would be useful when you're preparing. Um, but I think also going, get, coming back to consistently while you're executing your BCP, if you're consistently looking at your lessons learned and the additional risks that might come, then that's another way to, while you're working through a BCP, continue to make sure that you're on top of what's coming um, at you. Because, uh, I mean, there could be other things coming in, in this particular scenario that we're in right now that, that we haven't thought of. And so continuing to think about those things and what risks and impacts they might have is really important. Okay, thanks. Yes, this, this agile uh, life cycle is very important. Basically, it's an agile, yeah, it's a bit of a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a continuous learning cycle, exactly. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot for this. I would say too that like, and it, like timelines are talked about a lot, but if we're gonna make assumptions around scenarios, I would assume this one's in place in some capacity and, and going up and down in terms of like the closures for nine to 24 months. So that's what people are saying in terms of the vaccine and, and that sort of timeline. And, and it's a worst case scenario assumption, but certainly it means you ramp up into a certain model and then you maintain that model. And that model might need to be maintained for that amount of time. 
It also means that that model might have, there might be benefits to that model that you find become the new normal when, when this particular scenario is finally over, right? So that it, basically the different adaptations that you've made may turn out to be way more successful as for certain parts of your business, which is, which is I think what we're finding for certain businesses already. Like those stories are already out there. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks for the, thanks for the, this, uh, this presentation. <laughs> no problem. Well, that was a, a great point that Laurent had raised about timelines because we have no idea how long this is going to last and we don't know if a second wave is going to come. Correct. So your point was well taken um, that for a lot of organizations, they're kind of jumping into the middle of business continuity planning. However, I, I think undergoing the entire exercise given all the unknowns about the future that are related to this pandemic is probably a really really smart idea uh, for any organization any size business to take the time and just walk through the entire process so i actually have a question about that um, and i don't i'll put it to both of you so business owners tend to do some planning but business continuity planning is a little different than your typical planning process. Is there any one aspect of it that people seem to really struggle with in particular? Is it the scenario analysis perhaps? I mean, I can say anecdotally in observing, and Emily might have a completely different perspective, it seems like the communication aspect right now is what people are really struggling with. Mm. Like, I've seen some exceptions of people being really excellent, like literally demonstrating on social media how they're maintaining physical distancing and what your customer experience would be like walking through the door. Here's where you go and here's how you get safe. And then some that it's like, there's nothing even acknowledging COVID on their website at all. There's no difference in what they're doing or I don't even know if they're operating. I guess they might not be because they haven't acknowledged it. So it just seems like with this, everyone doesn't know what to do do or people are not everyone but some people don't know what to do and so they're silent and uh so i just think that's maybe the point of time right where we're at right now that's a bit of a gap but uh i don't know emily what do you think well i, I think that's probably true right now is that people are at different places of what they they like some people have been faster to adapt and, and address um address their markets than others but i also think if you go back to the beginning for bcp like developing bcps probably I don't know if it's the scenario analysis per se, but but even the idea of developing a BCP is very difficult for certain organizations because it means looking at future scenarios that are somewhat unlikely that uh, that have negative consequences and that we kind of don't want to think about because similar to when to what's going on right now, there are even bigger consequences in many ways to, than our own businesses thriving or surviving. Right, like there are literally uh, people dying essentially, right? So so people don't wanna think about that because it means all of the negativity around it. And I think if you're in an organization where there are people, that senior management is struggling to, to put in place a BCP or, or to address that, that that's, um, that's one of the things that's sort of, sort of like the elephant in the room that you need to sort of culturally address the ability to deal with negative, to talk about negative things in order to positively respond to those negative things. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes complete and total sense. And um, it, it's interesting that people, that you found that people are reluctant to sort of articulate those, those worst case scenarios. Just because you're considering them doesn't mean that's gonna make them come true. It's true. But, it, but people are, I, I think we're all, I mean, not everyone's an optimist, but I think most people err on the side of optimism and don't necessarily want to go down that path. So there are ways to sort of get people to talk about it or get your senior management team to talk about it without being alarmist mm -hmm. um, and being more pragmatic um, by, I mean, each each organization would be different, but I think it would be by, by bringing up the, um, the positives of being prepared um, and this situation we're in is probably one of the best examples of how being prepared could could help an organization um, just even organizations that didn't have a BCP and are still doing quite well just understanding what they've put in place and and how they've been able to do quite well is is probably useful so that lessons learned 
um, that we've talked about, I think could be useful for every single organization at this point. So what did you do well? What didn't go so well? What would you do differently next time? So that you know that if, I don't know, if, a, if another tornado comes and, and uh, but I mean, that it, it, those are things that happen. So yeah. And oftentimes the same lessons learned and the same models will apply to many scenarios. Correct. So making it actionable in the next scenario or as this scenario ebbs and flows is definitely a good use of time for all the knowledge that you've gained in living through this. Absolutely. And would you say that, um, to me, it seems like a, a good risk management process is kind of built into your business continuity planning. A am I right? Could you, yeah. could you use the same kind of thought processes to develop both at the same time? Because you're looking at all these potential risks or scenarios that you do or don't know are about to happen yeah the definite common thread between them is like what you would create as like your impact scale so like how significant of an impact would help you make decisions on business continuity but also just in general risks that impact your business so that would be kind of that consistent frame that you would use to assess things how significant is this and like how is it material to my finances my reputation my yeah. ability to meet compliance obligations how much of my staff or my operations, like literally percentage wise, would be impacted. Those sorts of threads within an impact scale would be how you make scenario decisions in your BCP, but how you make everyday decisions in your business. Awesome. And we wouldn't want to forget again the opportunity side too. So the impacts can be it can be again negative or or like the, the percentage impact and and all of financial, but the, those financial impacts could be positive too. And so could so could the requirements of your personnel. So maybe your personnel are impacted, but it means they're actually working overtime. So, so it's just, it's both sides, I think, that we have to look at. And similarly for business decisions, when you're doing risk assessment for business decisions, it, you need to look at both sides. Yeah. That's a, a good, good place to stop, is that, uh, you know, it can be both positive and negative. Absolutely. You just need to consider everything. Um, yes. So I want to take a moment and once again, thank Emily and Sarah. This was an amazing presentation. Your slide deck is so good. It's just amazing. I'm looking forward to sharing it. You could almost make a tiny little book out of that. Um, and I think people will find it a handy reference as they move forward with their own planning. So thank you for doing that. And uh, I, we were so grateful to have you on today. It was a total <laughs> pleasure. It was a total pleasure. <laughs> Just like channel energy into this just if it can be helpful to anybody we'll we're happy and i'm gonna do one final plug i know not everyone's on here but if you could um fill out our survey that would be it's three simple questions but it'll help us to um maybe work with the B the board of trade on future webinars or other pieces of information that could be useful to you so uh, we we really do want to help so the more information we have the more we can help yes yeah. And please don't forget, you can reach it to Sarah and Emily at any time if you have other questions. Like many of the other organizations that have stood up and said, yes, I will help, I will do a webinar. Um, it's about leadership, it's about giving back to the business community, and it's about helping other people right now. So yeah, please reach out to them. They are yeah. here for you. So uh, on that note, I will wish everyone a wonderful afternoon. Again, thank you, Sarah and Emily and Miami Consulting and uh, enjoy this beautiful sunshine today if you can get outside. Thank, Thank you. you, Lynn. Okay, bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.